Okay, so this is the beginning of module nine. This uh, module is gonna be for one week. Uh, so you should be reading the School of Assassins book. And I've also posted a chapter from a book that I wrote with the co-author on US foreign policy and foreign aid and its connection to human rights. So a lot of that information is what we'll cover in the next couple of lectures. So one of the issues, of course, is whether or not human rights should be a concern for, for U.S. foreign policy. And so what we uh, want to think about is um, whether or not this should be uh, something that the United States engages in, and if so, what are some of the problems dealing with human rights. And we already know that in the aftermath of World War II, a lot of nations were destroyed in their, in their social structure along with their political and economic destruction, particularly in Europe. And so the human rights atrocities associated with the war led up to the creation of the human rights regime with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we've already talked about, as well as some of the other um, international laws dealing with human rights. Um, but the implementation of a human rights policy from the United States perspective uh, was pretty slow to evolve in terms of, of U.S. foreign policy vis-a-vis um, -vis other countries. Um, and so while there was some leadership with putting together the human rights regime, um, the, there is concern and there continues to be concern that any type of international law would supersede U.S. law. And again, this is why the United States is not a party to the ICC. Um, and so, even though um, we know that the U.S. Senate did not ratify many of the international documents that we've talked about in the past, policymakers, nonetheless, have been very interested in improving living conditions in the less developed countries and began a commitment um, to the improvement of a whole host of human rights. And these efforts are evident in congressional legislation tying foreign assistance, for example, to human rights passage practices as well as passing legislation to fund programs under the direction of the U.S. Agency for Development, uh, otherwise known as USAID. After the Vietnam War and the policies of the Nixon administration, Jimmy Carter sought to further and more deeply link human rights policy with the U.S. foreign aid program in particular. And so there's been uh, different uh, congressional acts that have dealt with the uh, foreign assistance program uh, particularly the FAA Act of 1961 and other amendments. And President Carter made human rights one of the cornerstones of his foreign policy agenda. He attempted to, to uh, with little success, to make adherence to accepted human rights practices a key factor in granting foreign assistance to a recipient state. In the 1970s and continuing into Reagan's administration, Congressional legislature, uh, legislators argued about whether the United States should consider a state's human rights practices when allocating economic and military aid. Ultimately, Congress passed in 1982 something called the Harkin Amendment, mandating that no assistance will be granted to, and I quote, the government of any country which engages in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. Well, we know that there are caveats in the amendment that allow for some exceptions or loopholes when, quote, national security interests are at stake. So as a result, the United States grants and continues to grant extensive amounts of foreign aid to countries with poor human rights records in the name of national security. And so during the Cold War, recipients were client states that fit into the mold of anything but communists, this idea that anyone could get aid from the United States as long as they weren't a communist state. All right, and so those are the kinds of things that we want to focus on. Why does the United States attempt to pursue uh, a human rights policy when there is this tension between uh, what we want to do on the human rights realm and then what we want to do in terms of national security? And so uh, some, some of the reasons why we do this, however, is because of a history of U.S. concerns about human rights, but also this question of, or this realization that um, that the democracy model that the United States has should be, or the idea is that that should be a model for the rest of the world. And so the state of objectives 
of a foreign policy dealing with human rights is one of uh, themes that have been the improvement of lives of others around the world, including increasing the respect for human rights. So if we think about even before World War II, U.S. presidents expressed a will to use American foreign policy to shape political conditions around the world. Woodrow Wilson, for example, wanted to make the world, quote, safe for democracy by ending colonialism and supporting self-determination as elements of his 14 points. And then Franklin Roosevelt looked, quote, forward to a world founded upon four freedoms, end quote, which included the freedom of expression and religion as well as the freedom from want and fear. And Roosevelt stated that freedom means a supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights or keep them. And of course that support would manifest itself over the following decades in all kinds of tools. So not only is there history but there's this kind of morality issue that weaves itself through American foreign policy and that uh, we can see in things like the Truman Doctrine where uh, President Truman um, talked about a way of life based upon the will of the majority, um, based upon the will of um, um, the, the people, and that the policy of the United States is to support free people who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. He says, I believe that we must assist free people to work out their own destinies in their own way. I believe that our help should be primarily through economic stability and orderly political process. And so there's these moral foundations that other people have talked about in terms of the foreign aid debate, um, whether you're talking about giving aid during the, uh, the Cold War, whether you're giving aid to uh, Latin America during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s that we'll talk about. Um, of course, there's political reasons why there's a human rights policy, um, particularly uh, if we think about our, our relationships with those countries in Latin America. Um, there is the tie to democracy and wanting to spread democracy to other countries in the region. Of course, there's this idea of the U.S. as a beacon on a hill. And so given that, what's the appropriate action? Should we just serve as an example? Or should we actually intervene? There is some sort of positive action like a crusader bringing foreign aid, bringing investment, or otherwise using foreign policy tools to try and somehow influence foreign policy, and particularly the, the human rights in other countries. Of course, there is a potential problem with this particular human rights policy, and there's, there's several dilemmas that we should talk about. And the first problem, of course, is one we've been grappling with the whole semester, is what are human rights and whose definition matters? And so, I mean, if we think about the, this idea is like, whose definition? And this is where we get into cultural relativism. Is it going to be the more Western perspective, or um, is it going to be a more universal approach to what human rights are? So the first, the first problem is that of... Um, what do we mean by human rights? And the second problem is, do U.S. policymakers and the American public care about international human rights at all, and should they? Polls show that the United States public does care about human rights, um, and that this is a concern of p people abroad as well. And we know that policymakers, uh, at least rhetorically, refer to human rights as an important element of U.S. foreign policy. And then lastly, what are the, some of the constraints? And so this is where we get into these trade-offs. National security versus human rights and economic prosperity versus human rights. And so when it comes to advocating a particular human rights policy, what gives when national security is at risk? And so many people argue that we have a consistency problem because national security will always trump human rights. In the area of economic prosperity, this is where um, our relationships with Latin America are really um, illustrative, um, that the economic pursuits of the United States has meant more than human rights in some of those countries in Latin and Central America. So what are some of the tools that the United States uses as part of its foreign policy for trying to influence human rights? And some of that is diplomatic. And so this is where the United States will withdraw ambassadors, for example, or cancel trips abroad because of 
of human rights concerns. This is where they will uh, engage in private diplomacy, for example. Um, the United States will issue public statements and or condemnations, for example. Um, this happens a lot um, when we see or hear about human rights violations abroad. The President of the United States will go on uh, either in a press conference or in some other media fashion discuss the, um, that the United States doesn't stand for the treatment of those individuals. We saw that a lot during the Arab Spring, for example, where individuals were um, um, repressed uh, during their um, demonstrations and the, the President would come out and talk about how these people should have free rights to, to express themselves. There's all kinds of canceling events, boycotting the Olympics. This happened in 1980 with the Moscow Games after uh, Russia invaded Afghanistan. The United States and many Western countries boycotted the 1980 Games um, in response. Um, we've talked about some embargoes before in the Bosnian case where uh, either trade or any other types of embargoes would occur to try and um, stifle the, the actions of the perpetrating state. Um, secession of foreign aid. Uh, Jimmy Carter attempted this in the 1970s and um, uh, when he made a uh, foreign aid a priority and in fact this marked the first concerted effort at addressing specific human rights violations with foreign assistance at the executive level. And the view of the human rights uh, issue in the Carter administration was expressed by, by many officials. And for example, Warren Christopher testified before the House Committee on Foreign Affairs that, quote, our foreign assistance programs are an essential tool in promoting a broad category of internationally recognized human rights. But we know that this attempt to apply a single human rights standard to all states uh, ended up failing. Um, state, states behave differently in response to policies, and so some states responded better to quiet diplomacy, others to public criticism, and yet another set of states responded only to sanctions. In attempting to implement this particular policy of foreign aid, Carter was criticized for imposing standards in Latin America um, because he believed that he could do so because of their proximity while ignoring similar vi violations in countries critical to U.S. interests. Uh, so, for example, during negotiations on SALT II, Carter refused to link progress on arms control with progress on human rights in the Soviet Union. And so, um, you know, if you're a Latin American country and you're seeing pressure being applied by the U.S. president in one case but not in the other, uh, this became a difficult um, situation for those countries. Um, there was even cases where um, Carter, because he was so uh, adamant about this, um, countries of strategic importance, of course, were provided um, uh, aid despite their human, record, human rights records. And so in Latin America, countries simply rejected foreign aid in response to Carter's human rights policy. In 1977, Guatemala, for example, became, uh, became the fifth Latin American country to decline U.S. military aid because of attempts to link it to human rights. Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and El Salvador all had already previously denied foreign aid. And so what you have is a situation where in the 1970s Latin American countries are refusing aid from the United States and the, the, the fear then would that they would turn to the Soviet Union for foreign aid. So in the end, the Carter administration had little success making adherence to accepted human rights practices a key component in granting assistance to recipient states. And then I've already mentioned the Harkin Amendment. And then, of course, you always have military force to try and enforce human rights policy, but this does not happen very often from the United States perspective. Uh, we know that they uh, intervened in Somalia, for example. Uh, but all of these issues leads to the biggest problem we have, and that is consistency in our human rights policies. Uh, so states that are critical to U.S. national security might receive a different treatment than countries, let's say, that don't have any type of U.S. Uh, national security concerns. And so we see the difference in re responses to those countries.
But again, as I mentioned, President Carter um, was the first to really address human rights policy actively where it, be, where, where it was related to foreign aid. And so you can just read there his, um, his concerns about having a foreign aid program that the American people support and for a change uh, know about and understand. And of course, this is in response to the Vietnam era uh, as well. Um, some of the most coherent statements about U.S. policy regarding human rights were made by Cyrus Vance in a, in a graduation speech. And so uh, Cyrus Vance, the gentleman on the left in the photo, gave a speech where in, in April of 1977 where he says, Our concern for human rights is built upon ancient values. It looks with hope to a world in which liberty is not just a cause but the common condition. In the past, it may have seemed sufficient to put our name to international documents that spoke loftily of human rights, but that is not enough, he says. We will go to work alongside other people and governments to protect and enhance the dignity of the individual. So this is a very broad statement, but then he follows that up with um, some very specifics. And so I've highlighted here words that, seem, that should be familiar to you and this is where we look at these typologies of rights. So he says, let me define what we mean by human rights. First, there's a right to be free from gov governmental violation of the integrity of the person. These are those first generation of rights that we've talked about, security rights, torture, that sort of thing, and he describes those types of rights. Second, he says, there is the right to the fulfillment of vital needs food, shelter, health care, and education. Again, we think of these and know these as second generation rights. And then he says there's a right to enjoy civil and political liberties, and this goes with first generation rights as well. So when it comes to actual practice, the United States is far more concerned, we know, with the first group and the third group, because the United States has never signed on to the International Covenant on Social, uh, Economic, and uh, Cultural Rights. But he says our policy is to promote all of these. So how does the U.S. government do this? All right, so if you're interested in civil and political liberties as well as the inter integrity of the person, the U.S. State Department is tasked with uh, the policies on democratization and human rights. So this is the purview of the U.S. State Department, and it's the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. And so the U.S. works in concert with international organizations, NGOs, and other countries, and so basically the human rights regime, to promote democracy, and this is the goal of the United States. Promote democracy as a means to achieve security, stability, and prosper prosperity. And this is the idea if there's more democracy in the world, there's less conflict. We're going to assist new democracies assist democracy advocates, those people who are trying to promote democracy abroad, and identify and denounce regimes that deny their citizens the right to choose their leaders. And so this is the idea that the United States is going to document human rights conditions abroad, and they do that with the annual country reports that we've talked about in the measurement of the political terror scale. All right, so that's the democracy part of the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. The human rights part talks about the human rights as an important national interest, and the United States seeks to do all these things. I'm not going to read all that to you, but you can see uh, what they're going to do. They're going to try and hold governments accountable for the things that are in the human rights regime. These are the types of rights that they're going to focus on, promote the rule of law, assist other types of institutions, coordinate with our allies, and so all of this is in the pursuit of human rights in the U.S. foreign policy. Along with that human rights element is the pursuit of religious freedom, and so given the United States commitment to religious freedom, these are the types of things that the United States is going to do uh, as part of their goals on democratization, human rights, and labor. So how do they go about doing that? Well, we look at, we're going to look at just some examples of supporting elections, uh, supporting the establishment of new institutions that deal with democracy and human rights, doing things to support the strength uh, and strengthening of the law as well as just protecting human rights in general. So I have examples of each one of these. All right, so for example, 
the United States supports democratization and human rights by supporting and monitoring elections. And again, we have Jimmy Carter here. Um, um, I just wanted to highlight that um, Jimmy Carter has been much more praised as a former president than he was during, the pre during his presidency. And in fact, he won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, back in 2002. And one of the things that Jimmy Carter has done is to be a U.S. delegate in other countries that are monitoring uh, democratic elections abroad. Um, but these are some of the other things. While president, he was very instrumental in the Camp David Accords. He now has the Carter Center, which deals with all kinds of um, um, programs. One of them is Habitat for Humanity. But here he led a, a, an observer delegation for the elections in Panama. Um, and then he went to Nicaragua to do the same thing. He led a, a delegation to Haiti. And so you can see that he's often asked, as our former politicians, to uh, go abroad and monitor elections. So that's one way the U.S. supports democratization and human rights abroad. Secondly, they support the establishment of institutions. So the United States has put together this National Endowment for Democracy, and so it's a way to, to make grants available to support pro-democracy groups in many of the areas of the world that has experienced uh, transition to democracies or um, are in the very infant stages of democracy. So that's called the National Endowment for Democracy to help establish uh, democratic institutions. Um, they help support and strengthen uh, law after the fall of the Soviet Union. There were a lot of concerns about how Eastern European countries were going to revamp their legal system based on democracy and human rights. And so there was the Central and Eastern European Law Initiative who worked with the ABA to help law reform in the former Soviet countries as well as Central and Eastern Europe. And so it was basically a volunteer program that, that made um, American and European experts available. It was set up in Prague, not a bad place to be. And so eventually there was offices in over 22 countries and you've had a lot of money spent on promoting ro the rule of law uh, based on democracy and human rights. And then there's the actual protection of human rights, which can be problematic, as we've already said. There's the dilemma between a stiff human rights policy and diplomatic relations. I've already given you the linkage politics uh, example with foreign aid in the Carter administration. But there's also a reputational and consistency problem when the United States gives money to what are called ABC Democrats. This is anything but communist democratic states. So a lot of right-wing dictatorships, for example, received lots of U.S. aid and other types of U.S. support in the Cold War ideological battle. And so it's very difficult to talk about human rights if you're supporting a right-wing government that regularly suppresses the opposition. And then, of course, you can just look at the ICC debate that we've already talked about, about the United States not being a party to the ICC, and so how do we promote human rights as a policy when we're not a party to that particular institution? So, I'll, so I would just encourage you to be uh, mindful of that debate. All right, we'll stop that lecture now, and the next lecture is going to focus on uh, Latin America in particular and the U.S. pursuits of foreign policy there.